I am really excited to have uh, panelists from all stakeholders in our community here that I think can help us begin a positive discussion in the creation of a framework that can make an appreciable difference in Tuscaloosa. Uh, for most of you, you know that I've been here nearly 10 years as mayor, and on a monthly basis I sit down with Chief Anderson and we go through our crime stats. And it's a very comprehensive look of, of where crime is taking place, what types of crimes are happening, and I get the opportunity to talk and question Chief and his commanders about you know, what are the tactical steps we're taking to make Tuscaloosa safer. And for 10 years, I believe that our police department has done an outstanding job. But every meeting, it hits me that what we do at the Tuscaloosa Police Department is static and reactive. It doesn't do anything to solve the issues that we're seeing. Um, we could double the amount of police we put on the streets, and we certainly would make more arrests, and we might make communities a little bit safer, but it wouldn't solve the issues. And so when I began early January thinking about what can we do, it really hit me. We need to reach out to, to as many stakeholders as we can to begin a discussion and to have honest discussions about where we are as a city. It's now my honor and privilege to turn it over to Lieutenant Andy Norris. Lieutenant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, some of the things that Chief Anderson, when he, uh, some of the questions that were asked of him after his, his, uh, after his presentation is what I'm going to hit on today. We're going to talk about uh, mental illness in the jails, uh, jail overcrowding, and some habitual offenders. In order to understand how mental illness affects the jails, we've got to look at the history of it. Uh, this is based off of a study that the National Sheriff's Association uh, finished in uh, 2014. Uh, from 1770 to 1820 in the United States, mentally ill persons were routinely confined in prisons and jails. Uh, that was regarded as inhumane, so they went back to institutions. Uh, after 1970, uh, such persons were routinely confined in hospitals. But since 1970, we have returned the practice of mental, mentally ill uh, persons being confined in prisons and jails. And uh, in 2012, there were an estimated 356,268 inmates with severe mental illness in prisons and jails. There were also approximately 35 patients in the state psychiatric hospitals. So that leaves the uh, number of mentally ill persons in prisons and jails was 10 times higher than that of remaining in state hospitals. In 44 of the 50 states in the District of Columbia, a prisoner or jail in that state holds more individuals with serious mental illness than the largest remaining state psychiatric hospital. In Ohio, for example, state prisons, the 10 state prisons and two county jails each hold more mentally ill inmates than the largest remaining state hospital. Now the problems we see with this is uh, overcrowding as we talked about uh, after the uh, Q&A, uh, behavioral issues, physical attacks on the correctional staff and other prisoners, victimization of other prisoners, uh, deterioration of psychiatric condition of the inmate, uh, relegation in grossly disproportionate numbers to solitary confinement, uh, jail or prison suicides at disproportionate numbers, increased taxpayer costs, and disproportionate rates of recidivism. Uh, the largest, at the time of this report, in, uh, the largest public institution holding mentally ill individuals in Alabama was the Jefferson County Jail. Uh, approximately 20% or 483 of the 2,413 inmates were thought to have a serious mental illness. Now, Alabama has virtually no jail diversion programs and is among the states spending the least on public psychiatric treatment programs. With the emptying of the mental health facilities in the 60s, that was uh, referred to as deinstitutionalization. That was probably the most well-meaning but poorly planned medical social policy of the 20th century. Because the majority of the patients were discharged from hospitals, were not given up follow-up psychiatric treatment. They relapsed into psychosis and when it went back to commit more misdemeanors and felonies, and then thus returned back to prison or jails. By the early 80s, uh, three decades ago, it was clear that deinstitutionalization was resulting in a progressive increase of mentally ill individuals in the criminal justice system. Uh, as it continued during the past decade, the situation in the nation's prisons and jails has grown increasingly deplorable. And I'll give you an, an Atlanta as an example. Uh, Georgia Mental Health Institute, the number of inmates in the county jail uh, being treated for mental illness increased 73 percent, 
following the closure of the Northwest Georgia Regional Hospital, the head of the local county jail reported that his prisoners with mental problems increased by 60 percent. A 2006 report by the Department of Justice reported that 15 percent of inmates in state prisons and 24 percent of inmates in local jails were psychotic. Higher estimates of serious mental illness for individual institutions are increasingly being reported. 30 percent for Ohio's Stark County Jail and in 2006 40 percent of the prisoners in the Tuscaloosa County Jail were suffering from mental illness. As you know, we've seen the state uh, facilities close. Uh, the Alabama Psychiatric Services, over 28,000 patients were serviced by the Alabama Psychiatric Services. They have to go or somewhere else to find their services now. The North Alabama Regional Hospital up in Decatur, uh, 74 patients. The Grail Memorial Hospital down in Montgomery. Searcy Hospital down in Mount Vernon, Mr. Tyson's neck of the woods. And the Park, Park Low Developmental Center here in Tuscaloosa. The remaining three state facilities are here in Tuscaloosa. The new Bryce Hospital, which has 268 patient beds and is meant to house someone for about 180 days. Uh, Taylor Harden Secure Medical Facility, where people have committed criminal acts and have been found by the courts to, that's where they're gonna live out their sentence. And of course, the Mary Stark Harper Geriatric Psychiatric Center. Now, what have we done in Tuscaloosa? Uh, mental health here in Tuscaloosa Court began here in, two, in June of 2012. Uh, Indian Rivers, they assess the inmates to see if they qualify, and Judge Almond monitors the offender and makes sure they are in compliance with his orders. Uh, Indian Rivers originally charted and reviewed every inmate in the Tuscaloosa jail, jail at the time. There was about 600 cases. Uh, since then, they've additionally assessed more than 350 individuals for the program. And they maintain about 40 cases at a time. Uh, standard enrollment for an intensive treatment period is about 12 months, and we've, so far we've had 35 successful graduates. Five clients were dismiss, dismissed from the program for non-punitive reasons, and two clients ended the program due to EOS end of sentence. Uh, 22 pro clients have been revoked from the program since 2012 uh, due to you know, various violations, failure to follow up. Approximately 100 clients have been served through this program since June of 2012. The treatment team consists of one master's level therapist and one bachelor's level case manager. And an individual must have a diagnosis, of a diagnosis of a serious mental illness to be qualified for the program. And there are rule outs, of course, uh, violent felonies, drug tra trafficking, and uh, manufacturing such as meth, uh, manufacturing of drugs. We also have a contract with the University of Alabama Psychiatric uh, School, uh, Dr. Giggy. She comes to the jail once, sometimes twice a week to evaluate and assess uh, inmates that have been uh, put on her list uh, as possible candidates. Um, I think there's two rulings we need to be aware of in the, uh, the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has recently, one of them is Olmstead versus LC. And the Supreme Court has recently reaffirmed that and the Justice Department is, is enforcing this, this act uh, even more than they were in the past, and that is uh, they require states to eliminate unnecessary segregation of persons with disabilities. In other words, put them back in the community to ensure that they uh, receive services in the most integrated setting appropriate uh, to their needs. Uh, the other one is Washington versus Harper, and that's uh, more on the state level. That's what you might see here at Taylor Hardin, where someone is uh, maybe a threat to themselves or others and has to be um, uh, given uh, psychiatric drugs or, or uh, you know, stuff to make them uh, more stable. Uh, uh, and it has to be in the, in the best interest to uh, them medically. We can't let Americans' prisons and jails become the new asylums in the United States for the mentally ill. And we must not let those with mental illness languish in the jails. Once they come to our jail, it is our duty to make sure they are treated humanely and that includes ensuring they receive the appropriate treatment for a mental illness. And I think that's what we do with our, we started doing with our mental health court. And that's been a tremendous success. Uh, we're looking to expand it as I uh, talked to the mayor this morning, maybe get the city of Tuscaloosa, the city of Northport involved. Um, I think we mentioned, uh, Ms. Head mentioned the, uh, the Prison Reform Act. We've had that mentioned here in the Q and A before and uh, Governor Bentley signed that uh, just a few days ago. Uh, that creates a Class D felony that is designed to ease the overcrowding through uh, probation. 
and it sets new parole guidelines. Uh, there's more services in this bill to ensure recidivism rates are reduced, and it adds a new limited driving permit. Now, you may wonder, why do we need a limited driving permit? Well, oftentimes we see people get into the jail and they may have uh, child support. They can't drive. They may have a revoked license for some reason. They may have had a lot of tickets. It may not necessarily be a, a lot of DUIs. It may be various other reasons. Well, they can't get to work to make that money to pay that child support. So I'm glad the state of Alabama has finally in, uh, instituted a limited driving permit. And that limited driving permit could say, and I used to be a police officer in Atlanta, so in Georgia, we've had, they had limited driving permits for years. And what the limited driving permit would say is, you can go to work, you can go to the grocery store, and you can go to doctor's appointments, and that's it. If you're caught any other time driving, then you go back, you're treated as an habitual violator, and then you go back, you may have to go back to jail for a, a period of time and uh, serve your sentence. So that way we're not seeing people sitting down in the jail for, on child support charges sometimes for 1,000 days, 1,200 days, because they can't get out there and, and go to work. They may not have, like I said, they may not have a, a driver's license. Release inmates to federal custody if their federal sentence exceeds their state sentence. I'm going to be very interested to see how that uh, comes about and how the feds are going to cooperate with that. Authorizes an addition 1,500 to 2,000 more prison beds. And authorizes sheriffs not to take parole or probation violators if the jail is at overcapacity or if the violator has a severe medical condition and is a security threat. I don't think we're ever going to see the sheriff or the sheriff's office not take someone in the jail that's a probation or a parole violator. And, it, and the, the last, and this is just me skimming over this, it's 149 pages, and it's, you get lost in it quick. Uh, one thing is the pro probation violation here must be within 20 days of arrest. That's, I think that's going to be pretty hard to accomplish based on the levels we have. The court system, Judge England, Judge Almond, and Ms. Head, is, we've all sat here today and said how overtaxed the court system is. Uh, the average daily population of the county jail, not, our population, our capacity is 542. Uh, last year, our average capacity, was, our average population was 623. This morning, the population was 570. Uh, we booked in 12,000 prisoners last year. So 12,000 people went through that county jail last year. You know, a lot of people, and I told uh, the mayor this morning, we were having a conversation about some of the stuff that Chief Anderson hit on. It's a, I'm amazed at how people, you know, they ask me how many people were in the county jail, and I tell them, and they look at me with a shocked look on their face. There's 600 people in the county jail? Um, it's just, you know, people get caught up in their own little world and they go from A to B and they don't realize that things do happen here in the city and in the county. And yes, we do have 600 people in the jail. Now, the average stay, 86% of the prisoners in the county jail stay about 30 days. It's what, you, what a county jail is designed for, 30 days, or, you know, on average. We have about 10%, uh, uh, 30 to 180 days. 2.7% 180 to a year, and uh, about 1.4% over a year. Now, just like you have a seniority list where you work, we have a seniority list at the jail. And none of this is Ms. Head's fault, and none of this is Judge Almond's fault. And like, these are capital cases, and capital cases, as you know, are not like arresting somebody for burglary or arresting somebody for stealing out of a car. These cases, have to, you have to have all your... T's crossed and all your eyes dotted. Um, I think we've got one guy, um, Tamarcus Kendrell Thomas. He's been there since 2009. I think he keeps firing his attorney and keeps getting new attorneys and prolonging the cases. So we've got, you know, the oldest one's 2009, the other four since 2012. Uh, the bitch of offenders we mentioned a while ago. I think over 18,000 of the state prisoners in Alabama have had previous incarceration. Four out of every 10 inmates in the state prison have had previous incarceration. 35% of them are property crimes, 33% are personal offenses, 23% are drug crimes, and other crimes are 6.7%. We mentioned the uh, Habitual Offender Act a while ago. 
It was passed in 1977. Uh, when the Habitual Offender Act was passed, the prison population went up 840%. Now, what that meant was if you got arrested for marijuana three times, you're probably going to prison for life. Uh, the Prison Reform Act uh, that J Governor Bentley signed is designed to lower the inmates in the state prison to 137% over capacity. Does anybody have any questions? Do you have any idea of uh, the amount of money Tuscaloosa County spends on psychotropic medications for the inmates in the county jail? Last year we spent $294,000 on, on uh, prescriptions. And, and while we're talking about mental illness, there's two instances that happened. One last night where an inmate came in. He was, said he was off his medicine. He bit one of our sergeants. They just responded to an incident on the interstate about an hour ago where a guy's on the side of the interstate throwing golf clubs out in the middle of the interstate. And he was in a psychosis moment, and he's been taken to North Harbor. So, and, and I, I, want, I want to be clear that what we're talking about in terms of mental illness in the county jail is not somebody who's depressed because they've been arrested. Right. <laughs> we're talking about somebody with a serious mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, right. major depressive disorder, something like that. Right. Okay. I'd be depressed too. And a lot, and a lot of those are, are inmates who may get arrested for misdemeanors or uh, smaller cases. And oftentimes what happens is uh, they may, um, you know, we've seen a lot of group homes with the closing of the state facilities. So oftentimes what happens is you may have a caregiver that's, they, this person gets off their medication and this person, they can't handle them. So they, who's the only person they think to call? Law enforcement. And they say, well, he pushed me. He knocked me down. He stole this or he did that. So where does that person end up? In jail where they shouldn't be. And this person is not going to come bond them out because all of a sudden their problem has gone to jail. And the longer that problem is in jail, the longer peace of mind they have at home and don't have to worry about it and have the headache of, uh, of uh, dealing with it. Yes, sir. Again, my name is Jerry Carter. I'm with the NAACP. Uh, I didn't hear you mention veterans at all. Uh, a lot of inmates, I'm sure, who come through the jail system are probably VA patients who are on their medication and take it you know, on a regular basis. Do you all have a relationship with the VA or is the VA involved? Say if, a, uh, if someone is arrested and they're going to be in there as much as 30 days, which you say is the average. Well, 30 days not being on your medication on a regular basis could be very detrimental to a person who's you know, suffering from PTSD or whatever. Do you all have a relationship with the VA to, to partner and assist with veterans who may, you know, be returning from Iraq or wherever, or may have served in Vietnam, or you know. Absolutely, we have a veterans court, and we have a we have a we have a veteran. There's a veterans court, and we have a good, great relationship with the VA hospital. And uh, if some like, and as you asked, if someone comes to jail, they're they're not not going to get their medicine. They're going to get their medicine. No one's going to sit in jail and not get their medicine. Okay. So how often does a person from the VA visit? A VA patient in jail. Uh, if I, we started the mental health court in July of 2002, and, and it didn't take long as we began to see these individuals to find veterans in the group. So mm -hmm. we uh, began a veterans court just kind of with scotch tape and bubble gum, just you know to see them as we could. Then the numbers grew uh, to about a dozen or a little bit more than that. So we separated that group from the rest of the people in mental health court and we, we do it at a different time during the week. Uh, the VA has uh, a, a VJO, a, a, a Veterans Justice Outreach Officer or, or, or an employee of the VA. Uh, locally, her name is Nat Natalie Hood. Natalie is responsible for Tuscaloosa County as well as most of West Alabama. Okay. Uh, but when, when we began to see the veterans, the county and the county jail modified their forms to indicate this person's a veteran. Okay. So that helps. Uh, it helps Indian Rivers. It helps uh, Miss Hood and, and others. Aaron Wade is also someone. Mm -hmm. Michael Culver uh, is also another VA employee uh, that helps them identify that person and to find out if they'd be um, they'd be appropriate. And, and now, if I could tell you what's ahead for the Veterans Court, because we're still. Uh, in our in the infancy of, of that program, 
uh, the, uh, the Justice Department in November, this coming November, uh, through a uh, Bureau of Justice uh, grant, is going to come to Tuscaloosa and spend about three days in my courtroom with, I'll be, I, I guess, hostage for three days, but uh, three days with me, with community corrections, with the VA, and with the other people who are involved in the program. And they will give us kind of the state-of-the-art training on how to run a VA court. Okay. And, uh, and what is going to be, what is now, and what will substantially be different about the VA court from the mental health court is that you will not have to have a mental illness to be in the VA program. If you are a veteran and you have a criminal charge, you're going to be eligible if it is, unless it's a violent crime or a serious drug offense. So. One of the complaints that we have received, well, actually numerous complaints uh, to the NAACP is that uh, once a person is incarcerated and they're a veteran who's taking medication, they're more or less sort of cut off from the VA. And that's, you know, very detrimental to the, to the veteran. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm not excusing the, the, you know, the reason that they're there. And obviously they broke the law or whatever, but still, they're, you know, they're a person with a mental illness who was being treated by the VA hospital. And in most cases, they had a regular, you know, relationship with the VA. And now because they're in jail, that, that has been just cut off. And I just wanted to, you know, see if there was anything that, that can be done to be sure that someone from the VA was, I'm a veteran, that someone uh, on a regular base, base, basis, excuse me, could uh, be sure to check in with these veterans and make sure that they're doing okay. No, and you mentioned cut off. No, they're not cut off. Okay. Uh, the well, I'm person, just saying that's the perception that some of the families right. have. Right. Well, okay. uh, the person, the representative, actually comes to the jail. And um, I would encourage anyone that wants to come down and, and see me and get a tour of the jail and let me, you know, educate you on how we do things down there and how these people are taken care of and the programs we have. And, you know, please call me and get in contact with me. And I'll make any accommodation I can to, uh, to get you down there and, uh, and show you the, the terrific programs we have and, and how we are, are, you know, the mental health court, the veterans court, uh, GED classes. We just, um, you know, we partner with Shelton State. We've, uh, at one time we had the highest, before they, the test went to a uh, computer, when they would let you take it on the paper, we had the highest GED graduation mm -hmm. rate in the county, at the county jail. Uh, now we're just waiting on the Department of Education. We bought three laptops. We're waiting on the Department of Education to give Shelton State to go ahead to load the software on the computer. One of the things that you mentioned in the flow of your presentation is um, with the mentally ill from the Department of Corrections, once they hit their end of sentence date, once they're paroled out, whatever reason it is that the inmate's being released, we, we provide 30 days worth of medication. And it doesn't matter what level of, uh, they can be uh, on psychosis uh, or have other issues, antidepressants, uh, <clears throat> there's 30 days supply that we provide post end of sentence or at their release date. So there is a gap right there, and that's a highly volatile and vulnerable population. That's the ones that you will see that uh, have problems. And the other issues of homelessness and et cetera exacerbate that to where if you have an inmate with a psychosis, you're, you're generally going to get them right back in your county jail pretty quickly. And, you know. And, you know, we have a partnership with Maude Watley. We've had a partnership with them for about 10 years, maybe 12 years. And... Uh, they have, and Dr. Bobo comes every morning at 8 o'clock. And, and on the weekends, we have another doctor that comes and, and sees, we have a medical call. The doctors see them. And like I mentioned, Dr. Gigi comes. She's got a, um, a team that comes with her. It's not just her. She has um, uh, college students that are going through the psychiatry program. And they, um, they help her evaluate. And, and uh, she's teaching them as she's doing her job, which one of her jobs is a teacher. And uh, so the, we're making sure that it, no one gets missed and, you know, no one is in the jail with mental illness and, and we don't know about it. We ask them every question when they come in and, of course, it's up to them to tell us. And what I do is, uh, one, one second, Wayne. One thing I do is I send an email of all the previous week's bookings to uh, Indian Rivers of anyone that meets the criteria for the mental health uh, court program. 
Andy, I'd just like to make a comment. Um, I'm with the Narcotics Division, but uh, my name's Wayne Roberts, and uh, uh, the VA for years has probably been one of our biggest drug distributors in uh, Tuscaloosa. Pills are very popular right now. Uh, a lot of the local drug dealers are take advantage of a lot of veterans here. We, we see that a lot. You know, they go to the veterans and they fool them, whether they steal them from them or they give them a small amount of money for them and, uh, and they sell them on the street. Uh, and the VA just continues. It's, it's pretty easy to, I'm a veteran myself, so it's not hard to get, you know, narcotics from the VA. And most of the patients, they go back out and the VA usually refill them because they need them. But for years, that's just been a known fact. And some doctors, local doctors, I'm not going to say any names, have told me that they're one of the biggest problems with, you know, with overprescribing some of the veterans and the veterans selling their pills out on the street. So a lot of the stuff that we recover, uh, narcotics on the street, pills and tablets and things like that, they come from the vet Veterans Administration. I think probably the biggest challenge is just the numbers. Uh, you know, like I said, we're at 570 today. Um, maybe looking in the future of, of increasing the size of the jail. Maybe adding another pod. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is the females. Um, we don't really have a place to, you know, we need more, more holding cells as far as um, isolation cells for someone that's a, um, someone that's a disciplinary problem. Because right now we're having to just move the females from one dorm to the other. So you're just transferring the problem from one dorm to the other dorm. We have a disciplinary dorm in the jail uh, for the males, but uh, unfortunately we have a lot of uh, people that come in that may be suicidal or have medical problems that prevent them from being in general population. And uh, we have to put them in the isolation cells. So I think probably the biggest challenge is, is numbers, isolation cells, and maybe, uh, and, and that's dealing with the females. And Chief will tell you, and he mentioned it, it's always, it's about 10% of the same players over and over and over again. I mean, there's, you know, out in the county, and I'm sure it is in the city, you know who the players are and who's the one breaking in cars and who's the one making meth and breaking in houses. And Ms. Durham, Ms. Head can tell you, and so can uh, Judge Allman. Uh, you, like you mentioned before, we had a, a guy that committed 34 breaking and entering mo motor vehicles and committed two armed robberies while on community corrections. And the way we were able to was a GPS. And let me, and let me say, the, uh, in 2000 and, uh, I think I've got, the, in 2012, or maybe years before that, the, 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 the budget for the judicial system was $145 million, okay? For 2015, it's $95 million. Proposed for 16, is $75 million. So you know, we, we talk about the pressure that's the numbers and that it creates with the court system. We're getting less and less and less money. We're having to lay off more and more people. And what you're going to find is that the clerk's offices are going to be closed for several days a week if we're not allocated more money. And that means that if you're expecting child support, you're not going to get it. If you, if you have a case in court, it's going to take longer than it takes now. Uh, so this is uh, it's a problem. And I'm afraid the state may lose some good employees. That uh, I'll, give, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our, my coworkers' wife works in circuit court, and they were told the other day not to expect any raises for six more years. And they haven't had any in six years. We have troopers every day that want to come and work for the sheriff's office. Okay, while we're on the subject, this funding issue. And this is something that nobody, I haven't, I've been to the Hill once this spring, which is le less than since I've been in this position, but, but nobody's talking about this part. You know, they, they've mentioned closing our trooper post. A significant amount of our local revenue for courts, for our circuit clerks, comes from trooper tickets. 
They are down because they have decreased the numbers of troopers already. So that is a huge public safety elephant in the room that I don't know that anybody's even talked about. So um, here's, what, here's what I think our legislative delegation is telling me when, when I go down there, and, and, and I know John Tyson has spent some time there, and others of you have too. Until the leaders in our community and the general public call them and say, I understand that you're going to have to raise revenue, and I will support you even if you do. We're still going to be talking about this next year, next year, forever. I mean, it, it, and it's actually going to be worse. Um, the reality is that when there's not enough money to provide these services, and, and, and he's, he, was, he talked about a couple of aspects of the court system, victims aren't going to get their restitution payments. Cases are going to get slower because there are not enough clerks to do the work that has to be done between this and that point of the case. I mean, it's just we could we could probably the three of us could probably sit and John could help too. Could, could list we could talk about that all day. But until the public tells our legislators to do what they have to do to fund these services that we need that are public safety services. Um, and that, w that we'll support them when they do. They're not going to they're, they're not gonna vote to increase taxes. They're not going to vote to raise revenue by any means of any kind. Well, I think the, the hope, Lynn, is, and us mayors have talked about this for years, is that uh, I think, and I, and I really, you know, you, you, when I say the legislature, I know that's very broad, and there's obviously individuals that don't feel this way. But as mayors, we sense that the state would rather local governments increase their taxes than, than the legislature as a whole having to take on that burden. It's just, it's easier that way. Unfortunately, local governments are fa facing the same constraints. That's right. But you know, I know having, you know, part of today's summit is to bring awareness to these issues. Because Chief says something that um, really hit me, unless you've had your house broken into or you've experienced crime in some way, it doesn't matter to you. Mm -hmm. um, but once you have experienced it, then all of a sudden it's a real issue. And, I, and, and forums like this is a good way for us to begin talking about it because I don't believe the average citizen of Tuscaloosa and, I, and the average citizen of Alabama realizes how being at 192% capacity in our correction system matters. I don't think the average citizen knows that Bryce Hospital going from having a census of over 300 down to 263 matters, but we know. And I think the more we can talk about this and more have the discussions, maybe we can lay the groundwork um, for looking at revenue. Because I do think this, I, think, I do think the people that I work for every day, if we, if we were able to come to them with something that, was, that showed results, showed where the money's going, I think we could have a really good conversation. And, um, I, you know, again, that's why I think having these, these types of discussions are important because engaging the community about this is going to be key if we're going to get the legislature or local governments to address these issues. If you think of anything that you would like this committee to hear, send it to me because I want this to be, although it has, you know, mayor on it, it's really yours. Um, I like, I forgot who said it, but now you've become stakeholders in this. And so I really want this to belong to all of you and let us craft something that ultimately will improve Tuscaloosa County as a whole. And if you think of any other panelists you think need to be added, um, we certainly, there is, you know, this is not an exclusive club. We want to, we want to add whoever we can that can help us do something tremendous for Tuscaloosa County. Again, on behalf of our city council, I want to thank you for you know, giving us seven hours of your day. Um, and I look forward to uh, meeting with you again probably sometime in August and September and doing something great in, in the months and years ahead. Have a great day. Thank you.